Today's topic is the imaging lens. So recall from geometrical optics that if we have a system in which a distance d1 to the right of an input plane is a lens of focal length f and a distance d2 to the right of the lens is an output plane, then if 1 over f equals 1 over d1 plus 1 over d2, the imaging condition, then for any point at the input, all rays leaving that point will be focused by the lens to a point at the output that we call the image point. And the magnification is minus d2 over d1, where the minus sign indicates that if we start on one side of the z-axis uh, for the object point, then the image point will be 180 degrees opposite relative to the z-axis. So we analyze this quite extensively with geometrical optics. And today we want to ask what happens if we analyze this with wave optics. So to begin that, let's first just talk about spherical waves, because after all, uh, the response of a point source, the impulse response of free space, is a spherical wave. And so let's suppose here's the z-axis, and let's suppose here is a impulse at coordinates x0, y0 in some plane, then we will get a spherical wave that will emanate away from that. Its center axis will be offset from the z-axis by these coordinates, x0, y0. And in the paraxial approximation, we know that that will have the form of, let's suppose that the initial amplitude is a0, and then we have the spherical wave in, in the Prax approximation is 1 over i lambda d, e to the i 2 pi over lambda times d, and then a quadratic phase, e to the i pi over lambda d, x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared. Now let's expand one of these quadratic terms here. That'll become x squared plus x0 squared minus 2x0x. Now let's take all terms that don't depend explicitly on x or y and just collapse them all into a single constant we'll call a1. So any amplitude or phase term we'll just put in there. That would include the x0 squared and uh, y0 squared phase terms. They don't depend explicitly on x and y. And what's left is the explicit x and y dependence. There would be a quadratic term, e to the i pi over lambda d x squared plus y squared. And then there would be that times a linear phase term. Let's see. So minus 2x0 x times pi over lambda d, that'd give you e to the minus i 2 pi over lambda d x0 x, and we would also have a y0 y term. Okay, so a spherical wave will have a quadratic phase term and a linear phase term. And we could identify these as, so amplitude A1, say e to the i um, c x squared plus y squared, and then e to the minus i, or let, let's just put it like this, e to the i ax plus by. So a general 
quadratic term and a general linear term. And if we want to then make the uh, equality between these two expressions, well, we would have that c would be equal to pi over lambda d and a would be minus 2 pi over lambda d x0 and likewise b would be minus 2 pi over lambda d y0. So the point of this is if we ever see an expression that has a quadratic phase term and a linear phase term, we can always interpret that as a spherical wave. And, right, by we just take the a, b, and c constants that appear in our expression and make these uh, equations and then solve, in this case, we could solve for d ex explicitly from this. And then here, given a, and we already know d, we could solve for x0 and we'll solve for y0. So we could actually solve for the point from which that spherical wave propagates. Or, that would be in free space, if we have a system with a lens that might change the properties of the spherical wave, it would be the point from which it appears to propagate, the image point. So now let's ask, what happens to our spherical wave after passing through a lens? Well, let's say we have an amplitude A2. The lens transmittance function includes a quadratic phase term e to the minus i pi over lambda f, x squared plus y squared. It also includes a, another phase term, a constant phase term. Let's just fold all, everything that doesn't explicitly depend on x and y again into this constant a2. And then we had our original spherical wave, e to the i pi over lambda d, x squared plus y squared, e to the minus i, 2 pi over lambda d, x, 0, x, plus y, 0, y. And now we'll rewrite that as a2, e to the i, pi, over lambda d prime, x squared plus y squared, e to the minus i, 2 pi over lambda d prime, x0 x, x0 uh, x prime x, plus y0 prime y. Now for these to be equal, we'd of course have to have for um, our 1 over d prime, that would be the combination of these two quadratics, so that'd be 1 over d plus, well, minus 1 over f. So 1 over d prime would be equal to 1 over d minus 1 over f. And then x0 prime over d prime would have to be equal to x0 over d. And therefore, x0 prime would be x0 times d prime over d. And likewise, y0 prime would be y0 times d prime over d. In other words, by passing through a lens, our spherical wave is still a spherical wave, but now it looks like it comes from a different point, we'll call the image point. That point is a distance d prime to the left of the lens, and it comes from x and y coordinates, x0 prime, y0 prime. So this is an image point. And we can identify three important 
cases. One would be the case illustrated here, where the spherical wave comes in, it's a diverging or expanding spherical wave, and then it's converted into a converging or collapsing spherical wave. And this would be the distance from the point to the lens would be D, and then the distance from the image point to the lens, which in this case would be negative, would be D prime. So this is when D is greater than F. If that's the case, then 1 over D is larger, uh, I'm sorry, is smaller than 1 over F. So this is a smaller number minus a bigger number is a negative number. D prime would be negative. And we'll call it, that is a real image. That's the case where this spherical wave is converted to a, a from a diverging to a converging spherical wave, and it actually converges to a point. Now another case would be we have this point here, and the lens just converts the expanding spherical wave to a plane wave. Of course, that's the case where D is equal to F, we're in the front focal plane. So in that case, there's no image, or you could say there's an image at infinity. So that's the case of a collimating of this spherical wave. And then another case would be where we're pretty close to the lens so that the lens cannot convert the expanding spherical wave into a uh, converging spherical wave, but it reduces its curvature such that it appears to come from a point further to the left of the lens. So this would be the, the distance d, which would be less than a focal length, and then this would be the distance d prime. And so if d is less than f, then 1 over d is bigger than 1 over f, and this is a positive number, so d prime is positive. And this is the case of what we've called in geometrical optics a virtual image. In other words, uh, this spherical wave never actually converges to this point, but it appears from the right side of the lens as if it was propagated from that point. And of course, you could image it with another lens. So these are the three important cases. Convert a diverging spherical wave into a converging spherical wave. Convert a diverging spherical wave into a plane wave. Convert a diverging spherical wave into another diverging spherical wave, but one that has a different center of curvature. Well, let's calculate the impulse response of such a system. So here's our lens. Here we are with an input plane that is a distance d1 to the left of the lens. We have an input point, a delta function, psi and eta. And we know that's going to produce a spherical wave. Let's call that wave right before the lens, g1 of x and y. And then right after the lens, let's call the field g2 of x and y. And then we allow that field, whatever it is, to propagate out. We know it's going to be a spherical wave. Uh, we allow that to propagate out to the output plane. And then at the output plane, well, that would be the impulse response, h of x and y given an input point at psi and eta. So we already know what G1 is. It is a spherical wave, e to the i 2 pi over lambda D1 over i lambda D1, e to the i pi over lambda D1, 
x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared. Now, g2 is going to be that multiplied by the transmittance function of the lens. And we're going to explicitly include a pupil function. We saw that that was important in the Fourier transforming lens, and it'll be especially important in the current case of the imaging lens. So G2 will be equal to, and we'll put all the uh, constant phase factors into just one term, e to the i phi 1 over lambda d1. This 1 over i is also just a phase. e to the i pi over lambda d1 x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared and then from the lens transmittance function e to the minus i pi over lambda f x squared plus y squared and then a pupil function big p of x and y where phase phi 1 uh, includes this term here so 2 pi over lambda d1 and there's also the constant phase term for the lens that's which is n delta 0 times 2 pi over lambda and then 1 over i is minus i and that's e to the minus i pi over 2 so there's that phase there and now we need to take that field and oops propagate a distance d2 and that's not quite as simple as simply uh, following the convergence of this spherical wave, assuming right, that we're matching the imaging condition. This would be then basically a converging spherical wave if we didn't have the pupil. But with the pupil, we got to be careful. We actually have to calculate the Fresnel diffraction formula because this thing's going to be converging down, but in a manner that is controlled by this pupil function. So we'll end up with an impulse response, h of x, y, given point source at psi and eta, which will be, we'll write this as e to the i phi zero over lambda squared d1 d2, where phi zero will be two pi over lambda, all the phase constants. Well, from the first spherical wave, we have d1 times 2 pi over lambda. And then for the Fresnel formula for uh, diffraction over distance d2, we have a, a plus d2. And then we have from the lens n delta 0. And then we'll have a minus pi. That's for the right, 1 over i gave us a minus pi over 2. And we have another one for the Fresnel diffraction formula. So two of those gives us a minus pi. And then we also get the 1 over lambda d2 for the Fresnel diffraction formula. Okay, and then we've got the integration. And let's see, we've already uh, used x and y and psi and eta. So for the dummy variable of integration, I'm going to use alpha and beta. P alpha and beta, place of x and y, because we're not going to use x and y for the output point. Okay, e to the minus i, pi over lambda f, alpha squared plus beta squared. So alpha and beta are the x and y coordinates at the lens. Then we have from the original spherical wave, e to the i pi over lambda d1, alpha minus psi squared plus beta minus eta squared. And then from the Fresnel diffraction formula, e to the i pi 
over a pi over lambda d2, and then the output point is x minus alpha squared and y minus beta squared, and we integrate over the lens d alpha d beta. Okay, that's a big ugly, ugly mess there. It has the form of the integral over the lens of the pupil function p of alpha beta times e to the i a phase function d alpha d beta, where the phase function is all these phase terms here. So let's see what will those be. Uh, we've got minus pi over lambda f here from the lens term, alpha squared plus beta squared. And then here we've got plus pi over lambda d1. And now let's expand out these quadratics. We'll have an alpha squared from there and a beta squared from the second term. Then we'll have a psi squared and eta squared. And then we'll have the cross terms, minus 2 uh, alpha psi minus 2 uh, beta eta. So minus 2 alpha psi plus beta eta. And then from this term, likewise, we'll have plus pi over lambda d2. And expanding everything out, we'll have x squared. Oops. Well, actually, let's do it this way. Let's do the alpha and beta squares first, just to keep it kind of in line with the other expressions. So we'll have an alpha squared and a beta squared. Then we'll have x and y squared. And then we'll have the cross terms. Minus 2 alpha x and minus 2 beta y. Okay, so there's the expanded out phase. Now, obviously in doing this integral, uh, the quadratic terms in the variables of integration are really a pain in the neck. But notice, these will all cancel out if 1 over f is 1 over d1 plus 1 over d2, the imaging condition. Because in that case, here you've got 1 over d1, 1 over d2, minus 1 over f. So with that, all of the alpha squared plus beta squared terms cancel. So that's going to leave a quadratic phase in psi and eta, but we're not integrating over those, so that can be factored out. And a quadratic phase in x and y. Again, we're not integrating over those, so that can be factored out. And then all that's going to be left is a linear phase uh, term in alpha and beta. So the integral becomes, we'll, we'll leave off the multiplicative constants for now. We've got a quadratic factor, e to the i pi over lambda d1, psi squared plus eta squared, and a quadratic factor, e to the i pi over lambda d2, x squared plus y squared. And then the remaining terms in the integral, p of alpha beta times e to minus i at 2 pi over lambda. And then we have alpha times psi over d1 plus x over d2. Remember, in expanding out those quadratic phase terms, the, the psi uh, and alpha came from the term with a 1 over d1, and the, the x and alpha from the term with 1 over d2. And then likewise, we'd have plus beta, eta over d1, plus y over d2, d alpha, d beta. So, 
let's define the integral big P and U V e to the minus i 2 pi ux plus vy the u dv to be by definition little p of x and y so big p is the pupil function and we'll see that little p is basically the, the image resolution function or the point spread function so with that definition our impulse response h of xy given a point source at xi and eta is equal to we have the constants e to the i phi zero over lambda squared t1 d2 and the quadratic phase terms up here e to the i pi over lambda d1 psi squared plus eta squared e to the i pi over lambda d2 x squared plus y squared and then that times p of well It would be everything that multiplies the alpha here would be the correspondence to the, the x in this formula. So that would be p of, let's write it this way, x over lambda d2. Right? So e to the minus i 2 pi alpha times x over lambda d2 and then psi over lambda d1. And then in the y dimension, everything that multiplies the beta, well, you'd have uh, eta over lambda d1 and y over lambda d1. So let's write this as y over, uh, y over lambda d2, sorry. y over lambda d2 plus eta over lambda d1. So that would be your impulse response. And here, and we could rewrite this as x over lambda d2. And then for psi, well, we could use the fact that, remember that the magnification is minus d2 over d1. And so we could say that 1 over d1 is equal to minus m over d2 so we could replace here 1 over d1 by minus m over d2 so this would then be x minus m psi over d2 so let's re -put, put that over here then we'd have x minus m psi over lambda d2 and this would become y minus m eta over lambda d2 so we're all over common denominator let's look at the case where our pupil function is a product of rect functions rect x over a rect y over a so this would be a square lens, which is not very common. But we're going to use this because it's relatively easy to do a Fourier transform of rect functions. We'll look at the circular pupil uh, later on. So in this case, little p of x minus m psi over lambda d2 y minus m eta over lambda d2 would be equal to, well, little p is related to big P uh, by a Fourier transform or an inverse Fourier transform. Uh, either way you look, look at it. In this case, the recs are, are 
uh, even functions. So it doesn't matter whether you do a forward or an inverse Fourier transform. You're going to get sync functions. And using the scaling theorem, we get an a squared and then a sync um, a times this argument. So we'll factor it out a over lambda d2 and then x minus m psi. And then likewise for the y, we'll have a over lambda d2 y minus m eta. So what will that look like? Let's look at this in the image plane, x and y. Let's just look along the x-axis. Well, the zero of the argument will be at x is equal to m psi, which would be the geometrical optics location of the image. And then it'll be a sink about that point. So it'll do something like this. And the width of that sink, the distance from the peak of the main lobe to the first zero, we'll call delta 2. And what will it be? Well, it'll be how much do we change x so that this whole thing changes by, argument changes by 1? It would just be the inverse of this factor here. So that the change in x times this would be equal to 1. And that would be lambda d2 over a. So that would be, we call that the uh, resolution in the image plane. And how about in the object plane? Let's look at that. So likewise over here, this would be now in the psi coordinate. Uh, so for a given psi, um, that'll be centered at x over m and then there will be a sync about that and that will have the width we'll call delta 1 what will it be how much can psi change so that this argument changes by 1 well it would be just the inverse of a m over lambda d2. So it would be lambda d2 over a m. And m is negative, and we just we want a positive value for this, so we'll just do absolute value. And now remember that uh, m is minus d2 over d1. So that d2 and m would cancel this d2, and then you have 1 over 1 over d1. So that would just give you lambda d1 over a. So this would be the resolution on the object. This would tell you how fine of detail on the object you could resolve. And this would be the corresponding resolution in the image plane. So now, in general, we know what our impulse response is. So our output, g2 of x and y, is going to be equal to the integral of our impulse response, h of x, y, psi, and eta, um, times our g1 of x and y, oops, g1 of psi and eta, the psi d eta. Now, the problem with this is this is a bit messy due to there's a quadratic factor in psi and eta in our impulse response. It was e to the i pi over lambda d1 psi squared plus eta squared. And that makes it very difficult to actually do this integration. So we want to see if we can somehow take care of that. So the phase of that quadratic phase term is phi is equal to pi over lambda d1 
psi squared plus eta squared. And we want to see if there are conditions under which the change of this phase over the size of that uh, point spread function is small enough that we can neglect it. So what will the change in phase be? Delta phi would be about equal to d phi d psi times delta psi, which would be equal to the derivative of psi squared is 2 psi, so this would be 2 pi over lambda d1 psi delta psi. And let's say we want that to be less than or about equal to pi for us to be able to say, well, we can basically treat that uh, quadratic phase term as a constant. We don't care whether it's positive or negative here, psi is positive or negative, etc. So we'll put this in absolute values. We need to have two, then if we cancel pi on both sides, two psi over lambda t1 delta psi less than or about equal to 1. But we already worked out what delta psi is, the resolution in the object plane, that is lambda d1 over a for the square pixel, uh, or rather the square pupil, I wanted to say. So if that's true, we plug that in here, and then we're going to get 2 psi, the lambda d1s cancel, and you get just over a is less than or about equal to 1, and that means that the absolute value of psi must be less than or about equal to a over 2. In other words, we can neglect this quadratic phase term if the object size is less than or about equal to 1 half the lens aperture the size of the lens. Now I'll point out, this is for so-called coherent imaging. Uh, because certainly if you've ever taken a picture of something with a camera, almost always you're taking pictures of things that are much bigger than the lens. Well, that's incoherent imaging. We'll get to that later in the course. Right now we're talking about making images with, say, with laser light, with a highly coherent source where phase um, terms become very, very important. A lot of this stuff drops out when we look at incoherent systems. All right. So, so we know that uh, if we have a, a really fine resolution, we know that x is about equal to m times psi, the location of an output point is equal to the magnification times the location of the input point. And for a point source at some psi value, that will be concentrated near x is equal to m psi to within a you know delta x, which is what we called a big delta 2. And so we can turn that around and say psi is about x over m. And m, remember, is minus d2 over d1. And therefore, up in this expression here, psi squared over d1 is about equal to minus x squared over m squared. Okay, so that's just uh, plugging this in here for psi squared. And then 1 over d1 is minus m over d2. So the minus sign goes with the m over d2 that substitutes for 1 over d1 because remember that m is minus d2 over d1. And so this is then m over m squared cancels one of the m's and then leaves you minus x squared over m d2. And so with that, we can write e to the i pi over lambda d1. We're going to write this quadratic phase term, psi squared plus eta squared, 
So we're neglecting the change in this for a change in the psi coordinate as we do the integral because the, the point spread function, the amplitude of the impulse response is narrowly peaked near this value of psi. And so this can be reasonably replaced by E is a minus sign here. So we'll have minus I pi over, and we converted one over D1 to one over D2. So over lambda D2, and then we've got a one over M x squared plus y squared. So with that, our impulse response, h of x, y, given point source at psi and eta, becomes e to the i v0 over lambda squared d1 d2. Now we'll, we can combine the two quadratic phase terms because now they're both in x. Right? So we basically what we've argued is if you had a system that had a perfect resolution, uh, you know, zero width resolution, then this expression here would be exact. Uh, and so this thing we're writing here would be exact. This would be e to the i pi over lambda d2. And then we would have x squared plus y squared from our that's from our original x and y quadratic phase and now we have this additional one so one minus one over m okay, so there's all our quadratic phase put together into one term and then we've got uh, our point spread function p of x minus m psi over lambda d2 y minus m eta over lambda d2. So a little bit of simplification. So with that impulse response, we can write the output g2 of x and y is equal to e to the i v0 over lambda squared d1 d2, and the quadratic phase, e to the i pi over lambda d2, 1 minus 1 over m, x squared plus y squared, and then that times the integral over the input plane of g1 psi eta, p, little p, of x minus m psi over lambda d2 y minus m eta over lambda d2 d psi d eta. Now, that integral is almost convolution but it has arguments of the form x minus m m psi not the required form x minus psi so maybe we can massage this a bit because we would really like it to be in the form of a convolution because we have a lot of theory about convolutions and the convolution theorem and etc so what we can do is we can substitute psi with psi prime over m and eta with eta prime over m because if we do that up here then you have psi prime over m times m the m's will cancel which is the problem term there so let's see if we do that well d psi will be d psi prime over m and d eta will be d eta prime over m that'll give you a factor of one over m squared so we'll get a one over m squared. Now we're just looking at the integral. We're leaving off these terms up here for now. You'll have the integral g1 psi is replaced by psi prime over m and eta by eta prime 
over m, and then we'll have p of, uh, and as we said, with psi replaced by psi prime over m, the m's cancel, and you get then just x minus psi prime over lambda d2, and y minus eta prime over lambda d2 d psi prime d eta prime. Now that is a convolution. And this leads us to define this guy right here. We're going to call that g2 prime of x and y. What is that? Well, here's the input. And now this is the input that has been scaled by the magnification. Well, what is that? We're going to think of that as the ideal image, which is basically be the geometrical optics uh, prediction. It would be a perfect image of the input that has just been scaled by the magnification. So that would be called G2 prime. And then what we see here is the actual output G2 is going to be these, these factors times that ideal image that has been blurred by this point spread function. So in this point of view, we first form the function g2 prime of x and y, which is simply a scaled version of the input field, g1 of x over m, y over m, and we'll call that the ideal image, it has no blurring. And then the real actual image is g2 of x and y is e to the i phi zero over magnitude of m lambda d2 squared. We'll see where that comes from in a moment. Our quadratic phase e to the i pi over lambda d2. 1 minus 1 over m, x squared plus y squared. And then this ideal image gets convolved with this blurring function, p of x over lambda d2, y over lambda d2. So in this point of view, we, although this isn't what really happens physically, of course, this is just there's a continuous process from input to output, but we can imagine or conceive of the imaging process as proceeding in three steps. We first project the object field into the image plane. And that's this process up here that gives us the ideal image. And then we blur the ideal image by this convolution with this blurring function, p of x over lambda d2, y over lambda d2. And then finally, we multiply by amplitude phase factors, that's these terms here. And that's going to give us our actual image. So this denominator here, uh, originally we had in the denominator lambda squared d1 d2. And then from this change of variable, we also had a factor of m squared. <clears throat> 
And so that would be, well, we can write uh, that as lambda d1 d2. And m squared we could write as the magnitude of m times another magnitude of m. But the magnitude of m is d2 over d1. And so that d1 cancels there. You get a d2 uh, squared. This was squared. And so that becomes the magnitude of m times lambda d2 quantity squared. And that's where that denominator comes from. Now, another point of view uh, is obtained if we substitute x equals mx prime, y equals my prime uh, into our original uh, input output expression. And then what we get is g2 of x and y becomes g2 of mx prime my prime is equal to e to the i phi zero over lambda squared d1 d2 e to the i pi over lambda d2 1 minus 1 over m and then x squared plus y squared well it becomes m squared times x prime squared plus y prime squared and then this would be times the integral of g1 psi and eta learning function little p and now x becomes mx prime and then we had minus m psi over lambda d2 and my prime minus m psi over lambda d2 d psi d eta so um, d1 d2 can be written as the magnitude of m um, d1 squared because the magnitude of m is d2 over d1 so that would give you d1 d2 Let's see, and up here in this expression, we would have one over d2, and then here would be m squared times one minus one over m. Well, that would be m squared minus m. And what would that be? Uh, let's see, that would be, well, I could write that as minus one over m d1, because m is d2 minus d2 over d1. So that would give us 1 over d2. And then this would be times m squared minus m. And then that reduces to 1 over d1. 1 minus m. Um, and then here, we can factor out an m. And then we have m over lambda d2. And so m over d2 would be, well, m is minus d2 over d1, so that just leaves minus 1 over d1. So let's, um, up here, let's define this scaled version of the output as g1 prime of m uh, of x prime, sorry, x prime and y prime. And then what we're going to be able to say is that g2 of x and y will be equal to g1 prime of x over m and y over m, because we put in uh, this argument to be x over m, then this becomes x over m times m is just x, etc. And so let's develop this idea. Um, 
So in this point of view, we get that g1 prime of x and y is e to the i phi zero over the magnitude of m quantity lambda d1 squared times e to the i pi over lambda d1, 1 minus m x squared plus y squared times the convolution of the input field with the blurring function p of minus x over lambda d1 minus y over lambda d1. Minus signs come from the factor of m. And so in this picture, um, we do the following. First, blur the object field by convolution. Notice all the distances are just d1. We're referring everything to the object field. So blur the, the object field by this convolution. Multiply by various, these guys up here, amp, the tude, and phase factors. And then finally, project that result into the image plane. And that's where we set g2 of x and y to be a scaled version of this g1 prime x and y scaled by the magnification. Okay, so this is just another way to think about that procedure. And in the first case we looked at, the first point of view, we're doing the convolution in the image plane. In this case, we're doing the convolution in the object plane. So one or the other of these points of view can be more convenient depending on what it is you're trying to, to look at. So let's look at that object plane point of view. So we got G1 prime of X and Y is some amplitude and phase. The phase depends on X and Y. And then we have the actual input field G1 of X and Y involved with this blurring function, little p minus x over lambda, oops, lambda d1, and minus y over lambda d1. And let's call this g1 blur, g1b of x and y. And let's assume the most common case where the pupil is an even function of position. And so the same will be true then, that that's the big P of X and Y. And so the same will be true for its uh, inverse Fourier transform, Fourier, or Fourier transform either way, little p. So we assume that little p of minus X minus Y is P of X and Y. Just makes things a little bit simpler, we can get rid of these minus signs there. And let's think about the angular spectrum of this blurred field. G1 of U and V. So, right, the Fourier transform of a convolution is the product of the Fourier transforms. And then the scaling theorem will give you two factors of lambda D1, so we'll get a lambda d1 squared out in front. We get the Fourier transform of the input field, g1 of u and v. And then the Fourier transform of little p would be big P. And from the scaling theorem, that would become lambda d1 u, lambda d1 v.
So we see that uh, the pupil function, p of x and y, is effectively the transfer function. of the imaging system, the frequency response. Suppose big P, the pupil, big P of x and y is identically equal to zero for r greater than a over two. In this case, a would be a, a radius of, say, a circ function. Well then, big P of lambda <clears throat> d1 u lambda d1 v would be identically equal to zero for square root of lambda d1 squared times u squared plus v squared greater than a over two. Right, so we just plugged in here, replaced x and y by lambda d1u and lambda d1v. And now, if we divide out the lambda d1, bring that outside the square root and then divide by it, and what's left behind will be the square root of u squared plus v squared, and we call that rho, and rho is equal to square root of u squared plus v squared would be greater than a over 2 lambda d1. So that would be the maximum spatial frequency. And twice that maximum frequency would be the bandwidth. So B would be twice this would just be A over lambda D1. That would be the imaging system bandwidth. So let's sketch out an imaging system and see why that might be the case. Here's the lens, say with an aperture A, this is the Z axis. Here's the input plane, it's a distance D1 to the lens. And now imagine different spatial frequencies at the input. Well, those correspond to different plane waves. Think about a plane wave that just for which the uh, corresponding ray from the origin would just graze the tip of the lens, right? And so you'd have plane wave, wave fronts going like this. And notice what would happen uh, when it hit this lens, it would get cut off. In fact, half of the plane wave would get cut off. That would be we would, this part would be lost to the system because it would not go through the lens. It would go off into space. And so we'd only be taking half of that particular plane wave into our system. And we've said that the, uh, the input diameter would have to be half of the lens diameter. So that would be A over 2. And so this would be an angle theta. And we know that theta is related to spatial frequency by theta is equal to lambda u. And we can also do the trigonometry here. So this would be a height from there to there, it would be height a over two over d1. So that would be a over two times d1. And so that would define, if we take the maximum effective spatial frequency that defines the bandwidth to be that for which half of the plane wave is lost by this process, then that would be equal to a over 2 lambda d1, we just divide by lambda there. And of course, then the bandwidth would be twice that, which would be a over lambda d1. So that's just a visual way to see where that's coming from. So at higher and higher spatial frequencies, uh, those Frequency components are propagating at greater and greater angles, and increasingly, most of that, that energy from that uh, component doesn't make it through the lens.
Now remember that the bandwidth is one over the sampling period. And we see that this actually is one over delta one. Remember that delta one, which would then be one over the bandwidth, we already derived was lambda uh, lambda d one over a for an aperture a. So now let's look at uh, we could look at the sampling theorem, or more more simply in this case. Uh, with the constraint that object size is less than or equal to one half the lens size, which is A over two in this case. And each pixel correspond to an area, uh, area of delta one squared. Right, which is just the size of a, of the re resolution cell in the input plane, of effectively a pixel, or we could think of it in terms of the sampling theorem, is one over the bandwidth. Then the total number of samples would be pi times the radius of the input field, which is a over two squared divided by delta one squared, the area per pixel. And that would be pi um, over four a squared times one over delta square delta one squared would be one over this uh, quantity squared. That would be then another a squared over lambda d one quantity squared. And so, which would be again then would be pi a to the fourth over four lambda d1 squared, which would be the effective amount of information in the image that can make it through the lens. And again, that would correspond to the number, effective number of pixels. Uh, now let's look at the case where we have, we put a point source for our impulse response on the z-axis, that is at psi equals eta is equal to zero. Then our impulse response becomes h of x and y given a point source at zero, zero, is e to the i v zero over, we'll use the form lambda squared g1 d2, doesn't really matter for our purposes. And then we have the quadratic phase e to the i pi over lambda d2 x squared plus y squared, there's no psi squared plus eta squared because those are both zero. And then we've got this little p of x over lambda d2, and there's no psi because that's zero, y over lambda d2. And so if we look at the magnitude of that, actually the magnitude squared, the intensity, Um, well, the, the magnitude of these phase factors is just one, and then we just have this, this magnitude here, which we'll, we'll neglect, so we'll just say proportional to the magnitude of P of X over lambda D2, Y over lambda D2 squared. So if, as is most often the case, your pupil function is a circle, we'll write it as circ r over, and the radius we'll write as the diameter d over two. And then that's big P, little p, which is the Fourier transform of that or the inverse Fourier transform, doesn't matter for a symmetric function. Um, little p, x and y, is then j1 of two pi, d over two rho over d over two rho times d over two squared or and spatially rho will be equal to r 
over lambda d2. Um, and so the intensity would be proportional to magnitude squared. Let's see, we can take one of these factors, the two cancel that, and this two cancels that. So it would be um, d squared over two, j1 of pi dr over lambda d2 over dr over lambda d2 magnitude squared. And that is called an airy pattern after the person who first um, investigated this theoretically. And let's take a look at uh, what that would look like. Let's sketch that out. So we have an intensity that's proportional to J1 pi dr over lambda d2 over dr over lambda d2 squared. And so this peaks, of course, at uh, r is equal to 0. And then it has its first 0 when j1 pi x is equal to 0. We solve that. Uh, that gives you an x value of about 1.22. And so going back to this expression, we can say that the 0 will occur when dr over lambda d2 is 1.22. 1. 1. Two, two, and let's call that value of r delta. So d delta over lambda d2 is 1.22. And from that, we get that the delta would be 1.22 times lambda d2 over d. And this is very similar to what we got with the rectangular uh, pupil. Uh, there, this factor was just 1. Just, we call this delta 2 is lambda d2 over d. So with a, a circular pupil, it's a little bit slightly larger. And of course, it's completely symmetric, circularly symmetric. So let's imagine, let's look in the x-axis in the output plane. And uh, here is the center of one of these patterns. And it's squared, so this is never negative. It's something like that. Then imagine a second one. And you're trying to distinguish these two. And imagine the second one has its zero right at the peak of the other. And also, the zero of this is at the peak of that. And in that case, that condition is called Rayleigh criterion. And the peak of one of these is at the zero of the other. And that's considered to be the closest those two um, blurred pixels can be so that you can still distinguish them. Now, something about this kind of gets a little bit difficult if one of the sources is much stronger than the other. Say we've got this guy like this. And then we've got another field, say over here. And it's much weaker. Well, you can see that the, you get a problem in this case in that the main lobe of the weak source is comparable to one of the side lobes of the strong source. And so this is can be a problem when you're looking at, for example, a star field and you have a very bright star and you're trying to see dim stars or maybe even planets or something like that. Or if you're looking at a planet, you're trying to observe moons. The planet's very bright, the moons are very weak. And so, and, and even in just uh, professional photography, uh, this is considered a not a very, uh, sometimes a very irritating kind of effect. And so how would you get around something like this? And so you have to ask, where do these side lobes 
come from? Well, just like the side lobes of the sink function, they come from the sharp discontinuity at the boundary. So here's your big P pupil function, and it would do something like this. Right at the radius, half the diameter, you go from a value of one and suddenly to zero. In general, when you have a discontinuity in one domain of a Fourier transform or inverse Fourier transform in the other domain, you would get high frequency components. So here you have a discontinuity in the space domain. In order to build that up as a superposition of plane waves, you have to have a lot of very high frequency plane waves. And so a solution to this, or at least a partial solution, could be to make this transition smoother. Maybe you'd do something like this. You'd have a pupil function that would go something like this. We would call that an apodized pupil. Or in digital signal processing, or in, in general, time domain signal processing, we, we might call this windowing, adding a window to this to make it smoother. So you would suppress a lot of these high frequency components. So let's take a look at that briefly. So here in this image, we look at the Rayleigh criterion. So the dashed blue curve is one of these uh, impulse response intensities. And you can see that the first zero is about 1.22. And then offset from that by 1.22 is this dashed red curve. And then the thick solid green line is their sum. And you can see that there will be a little dip in between. So we would imagine that we could distinguish those two. Looked at in two dimensions, this is what it looks like. So this is the Rayleigh criterion for being able to distinguish two um, point objects uh, in a blurred image. And down here, we're looking at apodization. So here you've got the pupil function, P of R, so circular pupil, which just stops at a radius of 0.5. And then over here, the solid blue curve is little p of r, the blurring function. So let's get relatively large side lobes. That's these, this guy here. This is squared, so they're relatively smaller there. Uh, and then here is an apodized version of that. This is just multiplied by the cosine of, um, of pi uh, r, uh, cosine squared of pi r. And so it smoothly goes from one down to zero. And then here's the Fourier transform of that is the dashed red curve. So it broadens out by kind of smoothly transitioning here. You get less resolution. So this broadens out, but you get much smaller side lobes. So you trade off resolution for side lobes. And in many cases, uh, this is highly desirable because you're you want to avoid these, uh, these side lobes washing out some very faint object over here. Or sometimes, uh, like I was mentioning in professional photography, portraiture, and things like that, um, a, a slightly more smooth or blurred image without the side lobes is more desirable than one that has a little more resolution but then has these side lobes.